Good. Well, thank you all so much for joining us uh, this morning, and thanks for your hard work uh, serving our communities and keeping Arizona safe and secure. You know, before we get started today, I want to take just a moment to introduce um, the other members who are visiting from out of state and welcome them uh, to Southern Arizona. Um, first, I'd like to introduce my friend and colleague, Tom Tillis, who is the senior senator from North Carolina. And uh, it's really just an honor and a privilege to work with Tom. I consider him a dear friend, and he's also one of the hardest working members of the United States Senate. Um, so glad to have him here with us today. Uh, David Valadeo, as a member of Congress from uh, Central Valley in California. Uh, David and I actually entered Congress together back in 2012, and so have been doing this work together for a very long time. Really grateful to have him here with us. Congressman Tony Gonzalez um, is in his second, second, second term. term. Yeah. Uh, he punches above his weight, though. Um, <laughs> uh, he works like he's been in Congress for many terms. Uh, Congressman Gonzalez has been a key partner on some of the work that uh, we've been doing in the last several years around um, border security and adjusting and changing our border policies. Um, Congressman Gonzalez also represents the largest stretch of U.S.-Mexico border of any member of Congress in the nation by a lot. Um, 42 percent. That's right, 42 percent of the U.S.-Mexico border. And of course everyone in the room is absolutely familiar um, with newly elected Congressman Siskamani. Um, but we all remember uh, Juan from the incredible work he's done um, in the last more than a decade representing Arizona, um, Southern Arizona in particular, his work on the Arizona-Mexico Commission and his work uh, with Governor Ducey's office. And of course now um, just finished his first three months as a member of the United States Congress. And he looks none the worse of the wear, right? So. <laughs> more gray hair. More gray hair. Right. Still very young for Congress though, don't worry. Thanks. <laughs> so, um, I, I want to just thank these gentlemen for taking the time to come and uh, join Juan and I down um, in Southern Arizona to have an opportunity to hear from you all um, about the experiences of, uh, of communities in Southern Arizona. We've all seen firsthand how Arizona and especially small communities along the border pay the price for the federal government's failure to fix our broken immigration system. So as you all know, last year Senator Tillis and I rejected the partisan echo chamber that is so prevalent in Washington, and we partnered on a bipartisan proposal to help solve some of the real problems that our border communities and our immigration system continues to face. We knew that we had to start by securing the border. So we started our proposal by um, boosting Border Patrol agent pay, increasing the size of our force, providing CBP agents and officers the equipment and technology they need to do their jobs safely and efficiently. But we also want to protect our youth from online cartel recruitment. We have seen this as a growing issue. With the promise of easy cash on social media, Arizona's children, some as young as the age of 14, are smuggling migrants and drugs right here out of Cochise County, which is why I'm so grateful that uh, Representative Siskamani and I have partnered to introduce our bipart tripartisan mm -hmm. and, and bicameral <laughs> bill to combat cartels on social media act. This is a bill that we think will help keep Arizona communities safe and secure. We know that Arizona can't wait for Congress to act, and that's why at the end of last year in the omnibus budget bill, uh, I worked hard to secure over $800 million in funding for local communities like here in Cochise County through the CBP Shelter and Services Program. These are funds that make sure that our communities aren't left to fend for themselves in the face of a crisis that is not their fault, so that we're no longer footing the bill for the federal government's um, failure. So I'm going to continue working directly with my colleagues that are here at the table and our colleagues back in Washington, D.C., to pressure the Biden administration to take meaningful steps to support Arizona's border communities, secure the border, and to treat our migrants fairly and humanely. And finally, I'm really excited to share that um, thanks to the bipartisan infrastructure law that uh, I shepherded through Congress with um, then-Senator Portman about a year and a half ago, Bisbee Douglas International Airport is going to receive $223,000, and the Bisbee Municipal Airport is going to get $304,000. So we're investing in our um, land and our airports of entry. So this will create better and safer travel for Arizonans, to help us fuel a healthier economy where everyone benefits in the community. Um, what we really want to do here today is listen and hear from all of you. Before we do that, I want to turn it over to Juan so he can say a couple of words um, 
to folks from the community he served for a long time here. Great. Well, thank Thanks. you. Thank you, Senator. And, and thank you to my colleagues and Senator Tillis for, uh, for joining us here in, in southern Arizona and southeastern Arizona. I think that anybody that visits here walks away realizing this is a very different area in terms of the border community. As we were just saying a minute ago, when you, both, you, when you visited one section of the border, you visited one section of the border. You have perspective of that one area. Tony represents a very broad area, and uh, of course from California and North Carolina. We've been talking about that when this, what, what's going on, every state has become a border state, with, especially around fentanyl. I don't have to tell you all this. We've had many conversations around this, and this is one of the reasons why you all sent us and me specifically uh, to Congress to tackle this issue, and that's what we hit the ground running with also an understanding of commerce, and that's what we just came from right now, from, from the port of entry and, and knowing how to balance these two and where they overlap and when we, where we need to tackle them in, in, uh, in separate ways. So uh, it's been an amazing experience so far, learning curve for sure, but I do feel that I walked in with, with a very clear understanding of what you all need, and that's what we've been working on one of the the, the the bill that the senator just mentioned is one that we're very happy to be partnering on as she mentioned um, from uh, both chambers and also um, as an independent rep republicans and democrats getting on this bill of tackling this issue that we've been talking to sheriff daniels for a long time which is the issue of of the the targeting of our minors through social media uh, platforms like TikTok and Instagram and Snapchat that they're offering a thousand two thousand dollars ahead for our youth to come here and then take the dangerous journey up north driving fast inexperienced drivers we know all that you know all that so we we took action immediately to come to come here and, and fix this but one of the reasons that it's so important to have our colleagues here is so they can take home a perspective of what southeastern Arizona looks like and the challenges that we're facing here specifically and no better people to break that down for them than all of you that are that are here today so thank you for for being here thank you for putting this together senator and um, and thank you all for for your expertise and advice gentlemen any opening comments this uh, as you all go through um, what I want to hear most that's the local impacts I'd also for li like for you in the back of your head, because there are people in Washington that are squared off in their corners. Yeah. Um, and so we have one group that are generally people of my stripe. I'm a Republican who thinks that we should let the crisis at the border continue for another decade um, if there's any treatment for immigration reform. I'm one who believes that border security is priority number one. Shortly behind it is immigration reform that makes sense and sustainable. But for people who only say it's the border or nothing, they're basically saying that we can, you can, your communities can withstand another 30 million people over the next 10 years. So I'd be kind of curious if we come back 10 years from now and we've done nothing, what do your communities look like as a part of your summary? I just want to say thank you for having me here. I've been around uh, for a number of years. Obviously, Kirsten and I came together to Congress, and I've been to the border with Tony. I've been to the border in California. Uh, but seeing this different perspective and, and getting the opportunity to hear from you all is uh, something I'm, I'm looking forward to. But uh, this has been a great experience, and you guys are lucky to have two great members uh, representing you, uh, both in the Senate and, and the House. So thank you. Yeah, I should have said that, too. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll let you interrupt just for that. You can jump in any time. Yeah, I'll echo, echo that. Senator Cinema gets the job done. She finds a way over, under, or through, and, and that's a rare, uh, a rare trait in, in this Congress. And Juan Siscomana, y'all have a good one. Y'all have a good one in, in, uh, in Juan. Uh, I, I was stationed at Fort Huachuca many years ago. I spent 20 years in the, in the Navy. And uh, it, it's great to be back. It's great to be back in Arizona. Very similar to Texas. There are parts of Texas where people have forgotten us. Yeah. And the news cycle is talking about all these other things. Meanwhile, we're the ones that have to live it and feel it every single day. So I'm very, I'm very interested in just honestly listening to what y'all have to say so I can walk away. When I'm pushing the message in Texas, oftentimes it's no different whether you're in Texas or Arizona. We are all still in this, this fight together. And no one's going to pay attention to us unless we fight in order to get a seat at the table. That's right. Thanks, guys. I, I know we're still waiting for the sheriff to arrive, but in the in the time that we're waiting for him to start, Ian, do you want to kick off by telling us some of your thoughts around the perspective of Cochise County and how we can be most helpful? 
Well, um, sometimes it's hard to describe um, the things that we need from the federal government simply because we're on the border and it is a federal problem. But yet, when you have local law enforcement and you have local people who are stressed by what's going on, for them it's a local problem, it's not a federal problem. And so, when people are picked up and need to jail, it's the Cochise County Jail. And there's always promises of pay, but it never comes through. Mm -hmm. and, the, and if you pick someone up, they have to go to court. Well, that means that they have to have representation. So, that means that we have to provide all these services for these people. And not that we don't think they need that, because the law says that they need that and we will provide that. But our tax base is severely a, a government economy. You know, with the schools, the cities, the county, um, the, the, the state. If you're employed, most likely you're employed by a government agency. We don't want to be a government economy because we have nothing to tax. All of your buildings are not taxable. All of your serve, nothing you do is taxable for Cochise County. And so it leaves us in kind of a quandary of wanting to provide service but not having the resources to do it. Um, the one thing I want to, and it's, I think it's, it's security. Um, the new border crossing that we have uh, been allowed to, to have, um, I think is going to be a tremendous asset, not to, only to the state, but to the nation, because the statistics tell us that most of the drugs, the, um, the things that are, are coming into this country that should not come across the fence, not, you know, pack, backpack in anymore, they're coming through the ports. So we want to make sure that this new port is put in and the renovation that's done at the Raul Castro port provides all the bells and whistles. We can't depend on people any longer because people are susceptible. I mean, they, they start out as good people and they have problems and, and then we have susceptible border people working you know, at, our, at our stations. So we're hoping that the federal government will come through with enough money for this to be put together in the best way possible. And I think it's a security measure, you know, not, not just a, an economy measure for Cochise County, but we'll keep things from coming in that shouldn't be. And, and that's our goal, is, is to be good partners with the federal government, but not stepchildren, you know, and, and that's how we feel we've been treated for the most part, because we're rural, we don't have a large voice in, in even in our state, and much less in Congress. So when you put all those things together, we feel that we haven't been we haven't been heard enough. So that's my thanks, Sam. Uh, so, uh, gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you to our sheriff, Sheriff mm -hmm. Daniels. Thanks so much for being here. Thank thanks you all. Thank you, Senator. And I apologize for my tardiness. I had a doctor's appointment at nine, and you hauled those up and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Down here. <laughs> uh, but thank you guys so much for coming. We appreciate it. we appreciate hosting you and uh, some of your community letters uh, leader here today and. I know Juan is, uh, we've spoken to them numerous times on this too, but it's a challenge down here on the border. It, it's a challenge and uh, put it in perspective like uh, Ms. English is saying is, we feel abandoned a little bit. I'll just tell you straight up. I mean, last year we put 1,570 people in jail for border crimes. 1,500 are U.S. citizens coming here to commit international crime. Cost uh, taxpayers in Cochise County $4.3 million just for jail border related costs. My border population runs 40 to 44 percent. I couldn't do it without Brian McIntyre and Lori Zuko at the end over there, county attorney and chief criminal prosecutor, and all our partners in the room, the mayors, um, JD, our college president. I'm sure you can talk about that. But uh, we need your help. As Ms. Cindy said, we're a lot of the problem right now, and uh, we're absorbing it. We get very little support. We have a jail next door, and I'm just going to hit on this. It's 40 years old, it's past capacity. Uh, thank you, Senator. And Senator Kelly, uh, we got I'm trying to get like 2.2 million from you is what we're looking at. 2.5 million. Sorry. That's a 92 million dollar project. That's just eating us alive. Uh, we got 20 million from the state. Uh, a couple million from you all. Again, we're I'm not going to give the person the mouth, but we need more. Yeah. We really do, and our, and our tax people are really uh, taking the blunt on that. So we're going to continue. But we need to have the federal government back on our side. We really do. Because this is not a political issue. This is a public safety, national security, and a, a humanitarian issue. Over a thousand migrants died on U.S. soil last year alone, or last two years, and um, 800 and something last year alone. So that that's 
And we're, sheriffs are dealing with that every day, and those are homicides to prove and otherwise, uh, working along with our prosecutor. Then you look at the destruction in our community. So we need your help. It's great to have you, and it's great to actually, uh, and our guests from all beyond Arizona, because this is not Cochise County or Arizona problem. This is America's problem. Right now. But we got to recognize it, and I keep saying this, and I'll <coughs> share it with you quick, and I'm going to turn it over to my guests. But um, we we got to change the message. The message is it's okay to come across the border illegally. We got to change that message. Second of all, we got to enforce the rule of law. The books on the the laws on the book will work if we we'll enforce them. If we can get that, uh, and I'm just going to say this. The President of the United States has to stand united with law enforcement on the border and, and send that message that there will be consequences. And Secretary Mayorkas, uh, who we have not had much success with, I'll just say that, that sadly to say. I mean, I saw last week and it is a, call it what you want. But let's call it something that needs immediate attention. It is a crisis. Yes, I know that. And I, we live it. We don't have to tell yeah, anybody here right. in this room. Yeah. But uh, he's got to accept National Sheriff Association, I chair of the Border Security the National Sheriff. We actually gave him a 16 point action plan, which I'll share with anybody here. With um, my phone. Yes, we'll yeah. share that with you in your packets, and I've got packets for all of you that I take back with it but on our efforts. But long story short, is I saw him several, I handed to him in El Paso, Texas, about 10 other sheriffs, several months later after no response. And I actually asked him, I said, Did you get that? Where are we at with that? One of them, 16 of them? What did, did you give me something, Sheriff? Sure. We've never heard a response back. Yeah. It hurts. Mm -hmm. That hurts mm -hmm. because that's absent. And uh, I call it intellectual uh, avoidance, abandonment with attendant consequences. And that's what we're addressing. So thank you so much for being here. Um, and, and this means something to us. It really does. And Senator, thank you so much for leaving us. <clears throat> and I know we've supported a couple, national sheriffs, Western and Southwest borders, have supported a couple of your bills. Yeah. A couple of your bills. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we'll continue the to do that. These are the co-sponsors, right? Yes, yeah. Yeah. and I know Juan, and we'll keep doing that. You've got sheriffs on your side. That's Just right. get us to the table. We'll be there for you. That's right. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Sheriff, would you talk a little bit more about the uncompensated costs? You mentioned $4.3 in Cochise County. And these are the costs that you bear as a result of the uh, kind of crisis on illegal immigration. There's no compensation structure for this. What does it look like in terms of the breakdown of what those costs are? Well, that, the $4.3 million comes from those that have a nexus to the crime of the border. Yeah. Whether they're coming down to smuggle, they got stolen cars, but they're here, drugs, fugitives. We're not getting the best of the best coming here. We're getting the worst of the worst coming right. here to commit these crimes. And then it turns out the fair yields. Last year we had 600, Brian, correct me if I'm wrong, 602 victims of felony crimes in Cochise mm -hmm. County for border related. I mean, these are seven-year-olds that are stuck in trunks of cars going 100 miles an hour in the opposite lane with the lights out at 9 o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. I mean, you name it. Brian's been fabulous and Lori to take these cases. We've we'll talked to the U.S. Attorney's Office saying, hey, you got to set the game. I'll argue to Brian on that. But that $4.3 million, wow. we get, besides Stone Garden, that's the only relief. And the, the 2.2 for our deal, that's, right. that's the only relief we get from the federal government. Okay. So, and, and the state of Arizona, Governor Ducey has stepped up and helped us offset these costs. I know um, uh, Ann just spoke with our current new governor. I have not met with her, but uh, hoping to in the near future. But we have to be collective, local, state, federal, because we're all saying serving the same people. Mm -hmm. We're all serving the same people. Yeah. And uh, But that impact, I know, at the college, at the cities, and then most important, and Adam can talk about that, Chief Police from Sierra Vista, it's impacting the, this, is, this new norm has impacted the quality of life in Cochise County and all our board counties that are actively engaged in this. So, yeah, we, we got to fix it together. And um, right now, we're, we're acting like it doesn't exist. I call it a new norm. It's not a good norm. Uh, do you want to, Brian, do you want to talk to us a little bit about some of what you're seeing? Sure. Yeah, if you want me to talk to you. Um, I'm going to feel Lori's line because there's no better line for it. We live in a video game. I was born, gosh, maybe five miles from here, and this is the most beautiful county ever. It's the most beautiful place I've ever lived, and I, and I don't want to live anywhere else, but it's turned into a video game, and you can't drive at night without needing to pull over because someone's in a pursuit, or someone's headed to a pursuit, or there's an ambulance headed to rescue someone. You know, we have a 65-year-old woman who's killed by a 16-year-old doing 120 with two migrants in the trunk. Yeah. You know, um, recruited on social media. Recruited on social media. Yeah. 
from companies that say, oh, no, we can't shut that down. And we all know that's BS. That's right. Right? Mm -hmm. um, but, Senator, you, you said think about 10 years. What would happen in 10 years? So give me a real practical example. We got from the state uh, funding for a whole new prosecution position, border crimes only. I have enough money. I can pay him more or her more than any other <coughs> deputy county attorney in my office. Mm -hmm. Two applicants. Mm -hmm. Two. And they wanted to work from home from Phoenix. What? <laughs> so where will we be in 10 years? Well, Lori's probably going to retire. I hope to retire at some point. The folks in my office probably have plans to retire. And in 10 years, if I can't recruit lawyers, the person sitting in my desk can't recruit lawyers. If the hospital in Sierra Vista can't recruit doctors, um, et cetera, et cetera. In 10 years, our community will just fade down to nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and the Lord knows, God willing, Mark has plans to retire. Uh, <laughs> 39 years old. Yeah, no, you not know, retiring. Right. Yeah. So, you know, the year I took over, which is 2015, so in 2014, there were, I think it's the numbers right, it's 587 felony cases filed in our Superior Court. Last year, we filed over 1,300. Hmm. And I have one additional lawyer since then. One. Oh my God. So, yeah, today, uh, today, as we're doing this, our early resolution court is going on. There's 42 defendants on that calendar, two-thirds of that calendar. Felony flight, human smuggling, endangerment charges for accidents, aggravated assault for accidents, Drugs, drugs mm -hmm. fentanyl, et cetera, et cetera. It's like this this constant, the blocks just keep getting bigger, mm -hmm. and we're playing whack-a-mole with it. Mm -hmm. um, so in 10 years, what my concern is, is that there would, no, there would be no kid from Douglas who would wake up one day, a second-year lawyer, and say, God, I want to go back home. I want to, I want to go back home, because home doesn't exist anymore. Right. And that's the practical consequence for us. Thank Mark you. and I always say, and, and I'll, I'll be a broken record with it, this, this is not an immigration issue for us. It is a public safety issue. And people should be able to drive their children to school and not have to worry about these events. You should be able to, you know, I was just thinking yesterday, I was walking my dog along a, a roadway that's well known for these failure to yield events and thought, gosh, is this really the safest thing for me to do right now? Well, I'm going to do it, right? And we're going to stay here. Um, and so, you know, I think from very high levels, it's sometimes hard to think down to our, our smaller level, if you will. Um, but if you if you just think of that number, roughly 600 compared to 1,300, you know, we've doubled our prosecution rate without a doubling of resources, which results in an impact on and one of my favorite people ever, but which results in an impact countywide in terms of budget, defense lawyers, uh, law enforcement, judges, et cetera, jail. jail. Um, and we will keep pushing because it's our priority and because we, you know, I, I still shop at the local grocery store. Mm -hmm. So if I don't do anything, then people will ask me in line, why aren't you guys doing anything? And they don't care that it's a federal problem. Mm -hmm. what, I'm, what I'm seeing in Texas is Arizona's about a year behind in this crisis. You know, they're, so they, they started to figure out this is place to go. What I'm seeing in Texas is it started on the border, like here. A year from now, it's 120 miles in where the, right. people are having the same issues. So today it's you. Just, you know, that's Tomorrow sad. it's a, another county. I mean, this doesn't end. It just keeps spreading. Absolutely. Unique to our county is we deal with the fight and flight. We don't deal with the give up. They don't That's right. They're trying to get away. Yeah, everything's right. fight and flight. Yes. And I told these guys this before they came that, you know, some of them have been with us to visit um, other parts of Texas. And recently, um, uh, Tom came with me and visited down in Yuma. And what I told him about this sector is that this sector is where bad guys come to get away. This is not where people are presenting in the port of entry, saying, I claim asylum. This is where people who intend to do harm in our country come. And that's what makes this a very, very different port or a different sector than you might see over in, in Yuma Central, Summerton area, right? Um, 
and that, that's exactly correct. And we've seen, just in 2022, that 1578 that were booked, only 78 were born born. 1,500 were U.S. citizens, ages 13 to 72, former cops. I mean, every, you see every spectrum. That's right. And and they're told by the cartels, go, go, go. And between Chief Thrasher's team, my team, DPS, and Border Patrol agents working so well together. But the bottom line is uh, we got to get some support down here. We do. We're doing everything we can do in a collective fashion, but um, we got to get some efforts. I know Ann, who chairs our board, is just... It's cost us a lot of money. It is. It's cost us a lot of Chief, do you want to talk to us a little bit about the experience of the city of Sierra Vista? Uh, sure, and, and kind of, I'll sound kind of redundant here, but uh, you know, being the, the major population center in Cochise County, uh, with major thoroughfare coming through, two major thoroughfares coming through Sierra Vista, uh, when this all started, the majority of the pursuits were coming into the city. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's a, you know, the, dangerous situation we're in absolutely, in absolutely no win-win or no win situation period if we do nothing like we typically would do if somebody in a, we get in a pursuit somebody driving 100 miles an hour and really reckless they might be a kid you know the, the typical law enforcement response is to, to break off the pursuit in hopes that they would slow down and 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 follow the speed limit and that kind of stuff we don't do that anymore uh, so they just keep going for those speeds um, we break off pursuit, they continue and they come into the city, they cause an accident, you kill somebody, we get blamed. Yeah. If, we, if we block off intersections to let them get through the city, and they have an accident at the intersection, which has happened in our city before, That's right. uh, like 15 years ago, um, and a bunch of people are killed, we're at fault for blocking because they wouldn't be at the intersection. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, you know, I, I went to, to my boss, the city manager, uh, and, and I said, We've got to do something. If we do nothing, I feel we're more negligent. So, you know, obviously, we work with the Sheriff's Department and the Safe Streets Program. Stone Gardens are our, our avenue for that in, in terms of overtime for officers to work those pursuits. Uh, we went from, uh, you know, in pursuit wise within the city, uh, we went from 12 pursuits to 19 pursuits to 24 pursuits to 39 pursuits last year. Wow. Uh, and and number of felonies, I think we doubled the number of felonies that we sent to the county attorney's office. And that's just not pursuits, that's the drugs, that's the criminal, uh, that's all part of all this as well. Uh, and so, uh, you know, for the safety of, of my citizens in Sierra Vista, you know, and actually we don't even worry about jurisdiction. <laughs> it, it, here in Cochise County, it doesn't matter the color of the uniform, shape of the badge, we just get it done, and then, uh, you know, for the safety issue, and then the primary jurisdiction will come in to take care of the investigation if we need to at that point. Uh, but we, we have to work together like that uh, and work with Border Patrol. Uh, but we do need, uh, we do need uh, the federal government to, to really step up. Border Patrol's doing all they can. Yeah. They really are. Um, uh, and, you know, these... I, I'm glad to see that you're introducing legislation on the, on the, the social media side, because <coughs> uh, if we can keep that recruitment from going on uh, and, that, and those people coming down, because it's exactly right. They're not coming down here to do good. Mm -hmm. And they come in and actually they come in and they, they sit in Sierra Vista and mm -hmm. they wait. And so now they're doing things in Sierra Vista while they're waiting to pick up their loads. Uh, like know, petty criminal type of activities? Shop with things, they'll do that kind of stuff, yeah. uh, those type of things, and, and just little petty things, and, and they're hanging out all the time. Now, I'll tell you, Brian and I were talking. Um, we've done an effective job with the safe streets uh, where we've had a lot less coming through Sierra Vista. Uh, we just pushed them farther east into the county, and now it's Douglas and Bisbee and, and, mm -hmm. and, and Tombstone that's suffering mm -hmm. uh, regarding that. So, you know, it's just like it was. You know, when you, when you shut down, you shut down San Diego or and, and, and Texas and it pushes it in the middle, that's all we're doing. That's right. We're, we're just shifting it. So. Last year we put 180 people in jail for felony pursuits, FTY, it's fair to yield. A new law went in effect in Arizona on September 22nd of last year that if you smuggle for profit, we can charge you with a class two felony. From September 22nd of 2022 to December 31st, three months later, we put 139 drivers in jail for uh, uh, smuggling. We're the only county in the state that was doing it, thanks to Brian and Lori. So again, <coughs> 300. Yeah, 300. 300 since September. What happens if they're minors? Then, because it's a class two felony, they still get booked as an adult if they're 15 or above. And then we let the court make the decision of whether they should be transferred down. 
So obviously a lot of it will depend. If they're our, our biggest form of encouragement right now is if all you're doing is smuggling and you actually pull over, you actually yield to law enforcement, it's a probation plea, a way to not have a felony on your record if you complete probation. But if you hurt somebody or a dangerous citizen, then it's probably going to stay in adult court and you'll be prosecuted and you'll have an adult felony. So because Arizona law allows juveniles to be prosecuted as adults for major crimes at the age of 15, um, that's one of the reasons you're seeing this car the cartels do the recruitment of 14-year-olds. Mm -hmm. Because those 14-year-olds, even if they engage in the same exact activity, if they uh, reckless driving, someone dies, they get caught, they because they're under that age, they're not prosecuted as adults. And that's how they sell it. And that's yeah. exactly mm -hmm. how they're recruiting 14-year-olds. Mm -hmm. What's the youngest you've seen? 13. And actually, just because it wasn't Mark's case, but we had a 12-year-old. So now you have a 12 year old doing 120. Driving a car. With bodies in it. With bodies in it. But that's, that's okay to treat migrants right away. It's not. It's, the cartel doesn't care. Yeah. About it, right? No. <laughs> they don't care about the 12 year old, and they don't care about the exactly. migrants. If yeah. I can add two last thoughts for solution driven, set a local initiative, uh, thanks to the state partnership in Cochise County and, and sheriffs throughout, is we have 1,200 camera virtual systems that was developed about four or five years ago. Uh, last year, our camera system made 66,000 encounters on our cameras. We run the whole southern border in Arizona and beyond into New Mexico. We monitor right here in this building on the east side. We just purchased a $5 million building, which will be a first local initiative for border operations that will run human trafficking, uh, smuggling, intel, camera, and all special ops with our partners, local, state, and federal. So, we're doing our part, we just have to meet with national sheriffs to expand that nationwide, this model, and start working into our urban areas. We know the drugs, the, the kids that are being trafficked, all that's going to these urban areas, so we're trying to set up this network throughout the United States at the sheriff's initiative. Uh, but we're doing that with local dollars. Do you need help with that? It'd be great to get some help with you on that. It'd be great. Juan's an appropriator. <laughs> Actually, the truth is all three of these guys are appropriators. <laughs> 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 Mistake on, on this <laughs> year, Who, but who's invited here? That's right. We're doing. Our, we just had a big meeting yesterday. Uh, we're just seeding this, uh, but we're, it's working here. It is truly working here. Um, working Do you have data that we could use to help um, make the case of of moving this nationwide? We do. In fact, we're my captain back here is putting a proposal together right now for nationals because Florida, other states, Dallas, Texas, yeah. they're saying we want to be involved in this. So if we can integrate with these urban areas. Cleveland, Ohio. We had sheriffs from Cleveland. And mm -hmm. had, it's great. It's yeah. great idea. And uh, because I don't, I, we got to be collective on this because yes. what happens here, and I'll, I'll just stuff. I can do the media, uh, <laughs> but I'll share some stuff off to the meeting with you offline because we run. Also, we go to have, we have a financial crimes unit where probably twenty, thirty million dollars is flowing to another state from here. Mm -hmm. So that's that's sensitive information. But the bottom line is. We, it's all connected. I guarantee we can do this in any part of the country right now, and we got to get after that. Shoot the purse. You're going to find the crime. Yeah, too. sure. If I can jump in here real quick, because I, I think that to my fellow appropriators here, and also my colleagues on the Senate side, whatever whatever you see that's being done here is being done with very little, as you can see in terms of the funding. So yes. if someone knows how to work the magic with the with small dollars, is is Cochise County, County really, mm -hmm. and, and yeah. in so many ways. So whatever investment we have in here is going to produce way more than what we would normally see from that dollar amount. That's one point. And the second point is that this is the, the birthplace for best practices. Mm -hmm. When not only to be efficient, but the cooperation from around the table That's right. between doesn't matter if people are on what side of the aisle, if it's city, if it's county, if it's prosecutor's office, if it's a sheriff's office, this is a community that is working together when, when, with one common yeah. goal. So th this is also the best place to come get those ideas. So one, um, smart and productive with the dollars that we have here that we could invest more in, and also the, the systems that are created here could, could also be yeah. expanded nationwide. Well, I think the work that you all are doing in terms of um, the collective effort that isn't concerned about boundaries or turf is really yeah. important. That's one of the biggest challenges that we see in government is this concept of, you can't do this or I can't do this because of some, you know, arbitrary boundary, whether it's a city, county, government, yeah. or agency versus agency. We'd like to get the data in terms of how efficient this, this uh,
processes that you're using, but also a little bit of information about why it's integral that, as you said, Chief Thrasher, that you don't care about whose agency has jurisdiction, that you don't care about whether it's over your city boundary or someone else's. That, a little bit of information about that being critical to the success of the effort is really important for us to have. Because if we want to replicate this, we have to figure out how to convince other communities to have that same um, kind of approach of cooperation rather than turf. Well, yeah, you Free from it. And that's happened quite a long time ago in this county. Yeah. 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 Public safety became priority number one, and he goes to nine. You're a, you know, you're in a crisis with crisis when a police chief says we don't deal with jurisdictional issues with the sheriff. Yeah. Yeah. Sheriff, can we hear from? Um, let's maybe hear from our mayors a little yes. bit. Yeah. I'm Mayor Hughes from Douglas, and uh, I echo all what they're saying. And it's to the point now, I have citizens coming to me and say, why don't you guys just let them go through and let them go to Chicago, let them go to Dallas, let them go to North Carolina, and get them out of our hair, because it's causing issues here. And it's like, no, this is our country. We have to work together. And I can't say enough that, you know, I, Meeting recently with our uh, chief agent and the border patrol here, mm -hmm. he he was saying, "You show me anywhere else on this border where these guys get together and we all talk about the common common thread of what the issue is and how we can do that." It is a federal problem, but we take it seriously here locally, and that's why we're working together and that's why we stand together to be able to do that. We'd love for the federal government to come do their job. No offense to anybody. We but, would too, actually. Yeah, we're on the same page, man. But, but, it's, but it's not happening. Yeah. Yeah. And because we love this area, as Brian so, so eloquently put, this is a great area. We want this place to be able to raise our families here. And that's all we're asking for. But we do have the bad guys coming through here. We don't have the asylum seekers. Even when uh, President Biden further opened the border, we had one family come through Douglas, and that was it. <laughs> Peru. But on the other hand, I'm sitting out deer hunting this past October, and there to the north of me, is in the East Mountains, uh, east of Douglas, there's 15 camouflage backpack young adult males traveling northwest. And so I, I approached the, the Border Patrol agent in charge, and he says, they're taking my agents elsewhere mm -hmm. to process people. Mm -hmm. And yes. so we're concentrating on the most focused area that we have manpower to be able to stop this. And so it's like, and he, I won't share with you where he said, well, here's our open areas, mm -hmm. but I guarantee the cartels know that. That's right. Yeah. And they know exactly how it is. And so down in Douglas, we get, we get the bad people carrying drugs That's right. through here. Like the fence or don't like the fence, when the first fence came up back in the Bush era, it pushed a lot of the traffic outside our city limits. Mm -hmm. It's further pushed it, but now they're so bold. They, uh, and Sheriff told me a story about visiting some of the workers on the fence when they're erecting it, and up come two illegals, catapult, come over and come down, and they asked them, hey, what are you doing? We just wanted to see if we could do it. So the technology, like we just mentioned, I think is very, very important to our area. It's something that was cut off. That funding stopped right then, and that's when they were, the conduit and all those things were there, waiting for that technology to kick in. So again, we understand it's a federal problem, but we here are willing to help. But it's, it's, it's becoming a financial burden upon us. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the case, and we're, you know, like I say, when this first started, you know, Title 42 being reduced, I said, well, let's, let's gas up the buses because let's take them to Tucson. Let's take them to Phoenix and, and get them out of our hair because we don't have the ability to serve them. And so, again, I, I agree, Senator, it is a security issue first that we got to shut this off.
and then we need to seriously talk to put the eagles behind us and the party affiliations behind us and talk about legal immigration mm -hmm. and what it is and what it means. And it's it's frustrating that people that have never visited our border, your borders, to talk about that they say it's not an issue or they say that it's that, uh, it's not affecting us. Mm -hmm. Please and. and and I know I speak on behalf of all our colleagues here that if you want us back in Washington, D.C. to talk to a group, we're there. <coughs> because we'd love to ex express the word or host them. If they want to come, yeah. we're here. So. so, Mayor, I thank you so much for that. One of the things that I think we want to take you up on this offer is to help explain to some of our colleagues uh, from other parts of the country exactly the phenomenon that you mentioned when you were out hunting. And I think a lot of people don't understand, a lot of our colleagues don't understand that the cartels are in, intentionally choosing to bring asylum seekers to certain parts of the border at certain times with certain people to utilize the resources of our men and women in green so that they have to leave the field and transport and process. And by doing so, that leaves openings right here in Cochise County for the young men who are here solely to do bad, who are coming into the country trafficking drugs and are coming in to engage in dangerous criminal activity. A lot of people don't realize that it's a two-part strategy. And one thing that I'd like to ask you all to help us teach our colleagues in other parts of the country is that it is a two-part strategy. That you can say, we want to treat migrants fairly and humanely, which we all do, and we want to allow people who qualify for asylum to come to the country, but to recognize that the way it's being utilized right now is to facilitate the trafficking of dangerous people and drugs through. Exactly. Yeah. Amen. To that. I mean, you know, you talk about humanely treated. We had a, a snake bite victim 10 miles east of town. Okay. By the time we got word, it was, an, it was a migrant. I shouldn't say migrant. It was an illegal. I don't even mix words. Coming through, got bit by a rattlesnake. We couldn't get, by the time the word got to us, and by the time we got an ambulance out there, and they perished. Yeah. And so you want to talk about humane, please don't throw that at us. That's right. <laughs> because it's not humane to push them out into the wilderness That's to be able right. to do that. Yeah. You know, figure out a way to do this honestly. I, I have two daughter in laws from Mexico, I have one from Brazil. Yeah. And there's a legal way to do that. Yeah. And and there's good people. I mean Mind if I call you Juanito? Juanito. <laughs> <laughs> so my family Juanito's calls me so that's fine. <laughs> It's like I'm 58 years old now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I look 58, but I'm actually 40. Yeah. That was harsh. That was very harsh. You always be wanting to be <laughs> yeah. old. But he's a prime example. You know, parents have wanted to come to this community. My mother-in-law was one of those that wanted to better their life, wanted to come here legally. And so it, it, there should be a process for good people that want to come here. Mm -hmm. I think we're all, I mean, my family's from England and Germany and all, all around so it, it's it's possible, but I just I'm just frustrated that you know because some of us have ours behind our name that you know the D's don't want to talk to us and vice versa and it's sad because we're playing Same, with jump human in lives. The, jump in the independent water, it's good. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Mayor. Ma'am, ma'am. So um, I want to just talk about the. The impact of quality of life. Um, yeah. Sheriff Downs and um, I, my chief uh, about the high speed chases. It's 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 to a point where I'm. I have a 16 year old daughter. Um, she she just started driving. Got her first car, and now I'm kind of fearful of allowing her just to just to drive on our streets. Um, I taught her how to take the, the residential routes to go to school mm -hmm. um, and now uh, now that uh, the the illegals or the, the low drivers are, are now using the, the residential streets oh. to to, to uh, you know go 100 miles an hour uh, you know I represent almost 50,000 people in Sierra Vista and one chase uh, she will tell you this one chase ended up no more than what 500 feet from the school we went through the school zone. It went through the school zone. Went through the school zone and hit a bicycle. And hit a bicycle. Oh my God. And and my my mom fell this thing. Mm -hmm. uh, 
lives only what, what mm -hmm. five houses away from that school. I'm even fearful of my mom coming out and driving on, on our residential streets. Um, they're using the streets, they're using our thoroughfares, um, 100, 115 miles an hour. Um, and a teenager driving like this yeah. through our streets, it's in, I just look at my, my son and my daughter, I tell them, just be safe, pray for them every time they leave the house. Um, because I don't know, um, they, we, I, I back up, my house backs up on uh, one of the thoroughfares, one of, one of the highways, and I hear it every night. It's three times a night, just, just cars, cars. You, you know it's a chase. Yeah. You know it's, you know, and I'm just waiting for a chief just to call my phone and say, hey, sir, we got another phone tower. Mm -hmm. um, that's, you know, it's just, so, and it's just I, I don't know what to do. Um, mm -hmm. Chief does an awesome job. Sheriff does an awesome job. But we, we just need help. Yeah. And, and when I, the thing is that we have children out there. Yeah. Children hitting children. Yeah. That's, ma'am, I don't, I, I would love to come to Congress. I would love to stand before Congress and just tell, tell, tell Congress we need help down here. We, it's, it's getting to a point where I just want to keep my kids at home because I'm so fearful. I tell my mom, don't go out. If you need to go out, let me go out and get your food. Mm -hmm. I tell I'm, I'm a pastor of a church. I tell my church, this, if, if y'all need to go out, just let, let me go and get my food. Let, let me go get your food. Because it's gotten to that point. I just don't know what to do. Thanks, Mayor. Tell us about what's happening at the School. Thank you, Senator, and, and members of Congress. Appreciate you coming down. So, Cochise College is a is a countywide district on our original campus, uh, founded in 1964. is halfway between Bisbee and Douglas. It is the oasis in the middle of the desert. 550 acres has residential housing, has a full public airport. We run a flight school through there. Uh, it is surrounded by farm and agriculture land. Across the highway is private-owned property that the uh, the current pro uh, property owner is not willing to allow Border Patrol to come on. <laughs> I'm literally a mile from the border, so they have now free access. Once they get over the wall, free access through that property. The sheriff has some cameras. We appreciate cameras, but I will tell you, cameras can't be the solution because when we get them on camera, they're already in country. Um, they also, jump, cameras don't catch people. They jump the highway, <laughs> and they are now on Cochise College property. <laughs> Um, our campus is well lit, so at night it becomes the wayfinder. <laughs> head towards the campus. Cartel Tucson, head to the lights. They show up with lights. Now, here's where I want to share with you federal policy is not working. Decisions making in, in D.C. do not work. Uh, the current administration came out with protected people could not service any of hospitals, schools, or colleges or universities. Now, I understand on a federal level, if you're thinking of a major university somewhere in the middle of the country, maybe you don't want Border Patrol there. I'm a campus that's a mile from the border. When my security pick up illegals on my campus and we call Border Patrol, the solution can be, can you march them to the highway? Because we can't come on your campus. Now, under the leadership of, Pres of, of Senator Kelly, he worked with Tucson Sector. We did probably the only college in America that has a cutout that says a decision for Border Patrol to come onto our campus doesn't have to go to D.C. The decision can be made at the Tucson That changed the game. But I have illegal sleeping in our dugouts at night, sleeping in our hay barn, sleeping in our airplane on the runway. We've got illegals running down the runway. Um, it's become a major issue for us of how we do it. Now, fortunately, to date, we have not had any incidences. But I'm concerned about the, uh, the startle. So somebody's sleeping in the hay barn, our rodeo students go out to feed their horses and the livestock, and they surprise somebody in there, startled behavior causes disasters. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm fearful of somebody deciding they want to duck in and sleep in one of our student housing things, or sleeping in an airplane. Um, the Border Patrol has been wonderful. The Sheriff's Department, we've had great partners. Everybody works to help us keep in there. But it's getting crazy and we know that they are not we are not the point they want to be to we are the wayfinder because of lights then once they get to us they go around us we have cornfields and so when the corn is uh, high enough we don't get many on campus because they sleep in the cornfields once the corn gets chopped which is quite an incident we should introduce you to the rancher related to 
what they had to do in order to chop their corn. Mm -hmm. Once the chorn, corn is chopped down, we're the place to go. We're the place to hang out. We're the place to slide through. Um, it, it, it's just concerning. We've had to change a lot of our philosophies on campus on accessibility. I'm fearful that one of our students in housing is going to take up the opportunity to start transporting. Yeah. Uh, we're easily yeah. we have a number of cars that will come onto campus looking for their looking for their load. Yeah. Um, we're going to now secure our campus at night. You have to go through a security system to get into campus at night. Um, those are just challenges that we shouldn't have to face at a community college where access is really the key thing. Now, here's the interesting part: for most of our commuter students, those that live in Douglas and Bisbee and Sierra. They're actually okay with it because they've lived it their entire life. <laughs> but students I bring from other areas are not used to seeing men in camouflage running through campus. Um, it's just not the normal thing that you see, and it's detrimental to our, our learning environment. Some things I think that where the federal government can help. Recognize in Cochise County it is not an immigration issue. Anytime we want to talk immigration, this is not an immigration issue. This is a border security issue mm -hmm. in our county. Mm -hmm. Not making light of what's happening in other places. But the ironic thing is we end up with an immigration issue, a large group of migrants come in. Well, we do something, Coach, we're asked out of the Tucson sector to send all of our Wilcox station to Texas to process. The Wilcox station runs the checkpoints. So we shut down the checkpoints. Mm -hmm. If you didn't know better, you'd think it was part of the plan to shut down the mm -hmm. checkpoints yes. in the county where the cars are fleeing through. Huh. It What's doesn't that? make sense. <laughs> the other part that I'll say is we have a number of initiatives. Uh, uh, we, the Cochise College and the City of Douglas was awarded a grant uh, to put in broadband in rural in rural areas. Senator, we'd ask if you'd get with the White House to release that out of the Treasury. The dollars have been appropriated, the grants have been awarded, the Arizona Commerce Authority and the Governor's Office is waiting for that. Here's where the issue okay, is. Okay, we can do that. I've got the information for it. Here's where the issue is. The cartels understand what it takes. They have great communication. On my campus, mm -hmm. you turn on your cell phone, the tower you get is Mexico. Mm -hmm. You turn on broadband, the tower you get is Mexico. We have no infrastructure because the cartels understand how to communicate. Communication is the key. Rural Arizona has been left behind. We can't communicate. As the mayor said, we actually have conduit along the border that could go a long ways that remains unlit. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's just solutions that we could do that would just make life much easier for us mm -hmm. if we just take advantage of the things we have and the things we're trying to do and not allow a one answer for all problems okay. out of D.C. Okay. Thanks, Senator. I'm sorry to interrupt. We uh, have to go to conclusions. Uh, got to hear from the rancher. Before we do that, I want to hear from John. <laughs> so, John, uh, you get the last word, sir. No matter what it is, it's smuggling. The sheriff, county attorney, saber team, I wouldn't be out of business, but five guys from the sheriff department have controlled our quarter, 15 miles. Brian prosecuted, real simple. We haven't had dope on our ranch for five years. I got 15 people an hour coming through in camo, mm -hmm. but because of what the Sabre team has done, and five deputies did this with the county attorney. That, and we've got a 400-man station at NACO. Mm -hmm. Half of them are detailed to Tucson. That's right. The other half of what's left is running the checkpoints now. That's right. So we've got two guys in 13 miles patrolling the border. Um, it costs us about 33% more to operate on the ranch because of the damages, fences, water. The magnitude of the traffic, whether it's human or Border Patrol has access. Uh, I believe the Border Patrol, if they were able to do their job, that they can control the NACO sector. That's 33 miles from the Huachuca Mountains almost to Douglas. I believe they could control it 90%. And we've got a wall the whole way. That's right. But they don't have the manpower. And, and then their attitude is dwindling a little bit, and I don't blame them, but um, it, it is deliberate. And yes. Border Patrol has caught over half a million people on our ranch in the last 30 years. So it, you know, it's, it's a, we're used to it. But 
since Biden's administration's been in there, we somebody's got to be at the ranch. If during Trump, we could leave, but not now. And my dad's still alive, my wife. Um, one of my sons is involved, but he works for a state agency. <laughs> That's the only reason he can be down here and working for Arizona Game and Fish. But I can't stress to you, and I'm proud that, that you're talking to the sheriff about his saber program, because it works. And, and the government won't do that. Uh, they, they're getting along good now. I'm getting along pretty good with Border Patrol, but there was jealousy. Like Adam's talking about egos. It, the sheriff embarrassed Border Patrol because of what they're apprehending. And, and we can't get past that. And my last, uh, there's going to be another 9-11. Yeah. That, that's what's going to happen. And, and I don't, when we're talking about 10 years from now, I don't think we can make it two years if the numbers that are coming now, I don't think America can handle that. Yeah. And, you know, they come through me every day and they go live with you. That, that's the bottom line. And what are you going to do with millions of people? Um, but it's serious. Yeah. Um, we're still here. We're, we're not leaving, but, uh, you know, my hat's off. Ann is under the gun for budget, and, it, you know, it, it's just overwhelming. The, the, the magnitude of what's developed just within two years. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it, it's unexplainable. And that, I mean, it, it's explainable, but it's pretty blatant. And, now the last thing is we sponsored three guys to be citizens in my lifetime, and and that was the going thing. Mm -hmm. And now nobody said why bother. Mm -hmm. Right. We'll just come here and live in the shadows, or not even live in the shadows. Mm -hmm. uh, but Americans don't want to work. That's a fact. Yeah. Uh, so we need the labor. And then you know my I don't have a saying for independence, but Republicans want cheap labor, Democrats want cheap votes, and America wants cheap tomatoes. <laughs> I'll tell you, independents want avocados, John. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. All right, folks. John, thank um, you. I'll ask for you all to stay seated. We're going to proceed over to media time for a few minutes. Um, am I good to start? Yep. 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 All right. Uh, Sir, Mr. Harold. Yes. Okay, all right, sounds good. Well, you win. Um, all right, um, Yeah, um, any comment on former President Trump's indictment? So we are all here today 100% focused on the crisis that is occurring in Cochise County. Um, so I, I'm not sure I'm speaking for everyone, but I know that I am 100% focused on what's happening right here. You know, my experience is that Arizonans, the noise that's happening, what Arizonans care about is what's happening in their backyard. And what we heard about with your mom, in your backyard, with John's backyard, and what's happened for the families um, that are being victimized, um, that our sheriff, our police chief are trying to protect, and the bad guys that Brian and Lori are prosecuting. So I can only speak for myself, but I can tell you, I'm not concerned with that. I'm concerned about what's happened right here in Southern Arizona. Thank you. All right, and just a gentle reminder, we've had a great conversation here, so let's keep the questions to the event. All right, Kega. Hi, um, so what is the biggest takeaway you took um, from visiting the port of entry earlier today? You know, I, I actually want to ask um, our visitors what their biggest takeaway is. Juan and I have spent a whole lot of time mm -hmm. down here um, as, uh, as folks who, I'm a Tucson native, Juan's lived in southern Arizona for a very long time, but I want to ask our newcomers who are visiting us what their biggest takeaway is thus far. Tom? Well, there's $130 million appropriated to expand the facilities, provide better situational awareness, interdict bad things. And what we heard today was the federal government is doing the very best that they can to dramatically discount what the value of that investment is going to be. When you have uh, what we described as a double wide trailer that GSA charged a million dollars for to provide some uh, family processing facilities when you've got an old building, not particularly historic building, that could be used for making this a, uh, a top tier facility. 
and you're getting policy from uh, from the federal government or messages from Washington that you're going to have to spend more and get less. Uh, those are the sorts of things that we have to go back and, and work on. Uh, I'm amazed at how well they do with how little they have. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the takeaway is we, we've got to start getting to work on getting solutions down here that are reasonable based on the best expertise. And that expertise is not in Washington. It's right here. I just say they're understaffed and undersized. And uh, Senator and I were going back and forth with the ability to buy land around here and be able to expand the facility. Mm -hmm. But um, when you're trying to move products across the country, and trade is a huge deal for us all across the country, uh, it's something that needs to be resolved as quickly as mm -hmm. possible. I have uh, five ports of entry in my district, 42% uh, of the southern border, 823 miles. I would not have visited Douglas, Arizona. I've got my hands full. You could have blindfolded me, and what you are saying is exactly what my people are saying, the exact same thing. I would not have visited Douglas, Arizona if it wasn't for Senator Cinema and Juan Siscomani. They brought us here, and once you see it, you can't unsee it. And you see all the different needs that we have to do, and, and being on the House side, Juan's an appropriator. Uh, Juan Siscomani is going to tell me what we need to do in order to get that port where it needs to go. Yeah, Juan. Well, I, I echo that, of course. We've seen it several times. Now, uh, sitting on the federal side, I've been working on the state side for over 80 years, and we've been seeing it through that lens. Now, on the lens of the federal side, as an appropriator as well, there, there are a lot of uh, efficiencies that we can fix. There's some low-hanging fruit, actually, that we can probably go back and, and ask some very direct questions and get some answers. There's funding issues, of course, and there's personnel. But I've got to tell you, I'm, I've always been proud of our, of our force at the border. And, and after today, I'm even more proud to see all that they do, the men and women there that are not facilitating only the trade and tourism aspect, but everything else that has been uh, dumped on them for a lack of leadership from, from this White House on this issue, to be very frank with you. That's been a big, big problem, and, and we need to call it what it is. They're living it every single day. They're saving lives. I think they said they've delivered about four babies. Five babies, Five they babies, this year. they said, this year. Not to mention the fentanyl overdose emergencies that, that uh, people from Mexico bring over to them to the border just so they can save them. So their, their, their job duties are going way beyond what they were even trained to do. And, and they can hire people quick enough because of the process of how long it takes. So there are so many layers to this that when looking at us as a newcomer like I am in my fourth month in, I'm looking at this thinking th these are all things that we could easily and should be able to easily fix. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I'm, I'm leaving even more uh, better informed, I should say, uh, even though I've been, as, as Senator Senator mentioned, here for a long time. Every time I come, I learn more. And I, and I learned more about the sacrifices and the work that is being done by our, by our brave people right there on Customs and Border Protection. Thanks, Juan. I would say I've got two big takeaways so far from this morning. And the first takeaway is um, the incredible collaboration that we're seeing right here with the Sabre Project. And part of my personal goal is to get this data, get this information, and help replicate this and expand it to other parts of the country. Because it's this level of cooperation and collaboration without the ego that leads to successes that save lives and protect communities, even in the face of an unwilling or uncooperative or levels of incompetent federal bureaucracy. Um, so that's one takeaway. The second takeaway is that I'm committed to bring in our mayors to DC to help mm -hmm. teach other members of Congress in both the House and the Senate about the strategy that the cartels are using to exploit the broken system in our country that allows for this lack of border security, this level of illegal immigration that is dangerous and, and jeopardizing lives and the security of our communities across the border. Mm -hmm. So that's the other big thing that I'm thinking of is the chair of the border subcommittee um, for the Homeland Security Committee in the Senate. I've got my head around what hearing am I going to hold soon for you guys to come and talk about what this actually looks like and what it means. So that folks on both sides of the aisle, who, as Tom said, are kind of stuck in their corners, right? Um, so they can see that the narratives that they're sharing of my way or the highway fail to address the holistic nature of this problem. The cartels are strategically orchestrating this effort 
um, across our border, and we are losing. Mm -hmm. They are winning. All right, Arizona Republic. Hi, uh, Senator Sinema. Have you received a response from the General Services Administration about the preparations for the end of Title 42? And if not, have you had any conversations with Arizona officials or local officials about any preparations before May 11th? The Department of Homeland Security has not given us the information that we've requested about preparations for the end of Title 42, despite the fact that I have been asking for that for well over a year. In both letter, introducing legislation that requires Title 42 to be extended until a plan is in place, the reality is, is that it appears that there is no plan in place. And if planning has um, been undertaken, it is certainly not adequate to meet what we expect to be a massive flow. Um, which will <coughs> devastate and overwhelm parts of Arizona and Texas's border. Now, as we've heard today, this county is, this is not a Title 42 county, right? The cartels have chosen to bring the illicit guys, the bad guys who are smuggling drugs and are here to do bad through this, through this part of our, count, of, of our state. But we know that the end of Title 42 <coughs> will have an unbelievable impact on our other ports of entry across other parts of southern Arizona and across Texas as well. So the answer is no. Unsurprisingly, I have not received a response about their preparations. Is the observer? No? Okay, KLD, another step? Yeah, we just did a story on the juvie and how really they, well, it shut down all the, all the um, juveniles that are getting arrested for minor crimes. They're dealing with it in another way or sending them to Sierra Vista. Um, but something that we did talk about is that a lot of you mentioned is how these young folks are getting um, pulled in through TikTok and Instagram right. to drive these migrants. I know you all talked about how huge of a problem that is. Would you say that that's one of the biggest issues right now that you all are seeing? Yes. Yes, and I'm going to take this opportunity to remind uh, you and, and the viewers that there's a bill that I've um, sponsored in the Senate one is sponsored the bill in the House that would require those social media companies to provide information sharing and cooperation with the government so that we can crack down on the cartels. Not only are they controlling the strategy of who enters our country, how and when, mm -hmm. and what drugs or other individuals they bring with them, they're also controlling what's happening on these social media outlets. Um, and right now, there's zero cooperation by these companies with the United States government there's zero accountability, and they're refusing to acknowledge that lives are being lost because of this. So I'd encourage you to, um, and we'll follow up with the language of our legislation, um, we're going to continue to uh, hold those social media companies accountable, and we're going to push our colleagues on both sides of the aisle in both chambers to move this legislation forward. Mm -hmm. Well, well th this is just another example of, of how we need to tackle this issue, with, which is from every area. The cartels are on a clear mission to exploit every loophole out there in our system, in our laws, in our culture as well. And, and uh, this lack of communication and cooperation between these uh, companies and the government, they're exploiting that and they're targeting our kids. I'm a, I'm a father of six. This, this issue is one of the issues that keeps us up at night. Tony is a father of six as well, young kids. So these are the kind of issues that as a dad, I'm an immigrant as well. They, you know, it's just, it, this is personal. This is very personal in a lot of ways and a lot of levels. And even when we saw at the port right now with more technology, but we still need human power to work that technology and view those x-ray images that are coming through. So these are all the things that we need. So it's not just more technology. It's not just tackling this issue through this bill that we're proudly co-sponsoring. It's really an all of the above, That's everything right. on the table kind of approach. That's right. Thank you. All right, we're going to do K-Gun. Okay. Um, so we heard today a lot about how this is more of a border security, public safety issue rather than immigration, which a lot of people kind of think border immigration. So I just want to get your reflection and thought on what our, our community members said about it being more of a border security issue. Well, I think it's both. I just think that we have to recognize that if, if you're going to get, this is all about getting votes, right? And it's about getting votes in, in the House and the Senate. There is no reasonable path to a purely border security bill without recognizing that one of the future flow, if, if, you, if you think about border security priorities, what we're trying to do is reduce future flows to get them to a level where border security law enforcement uh, can actually manage the situation. 
one of the ways that I think that you can influence future flows after we, as we move forward with border security measures is to give people the opportunity to immigrate here legally or either work here legally. Um, and if we, the, the problem that you have now with 17 years to a green card, very, very difficult to even get guest workers in and out of here, even though many of them are returning workers, you have to take a look at those policies and put them on the table. And without some balance, nothing will get done. Mm -hmm. And your 10 year scenario is a real risk. Yeah. So that's why we have to, that's why we have to balance the two. We also have to address um, some of the problems in our current immigration legal system, mm -hmm. right? So the cartels are using the flawed asylum process as a huge loophole to choose who comes into the country in what manner, where they present from. And I mean, they get to choose. We don't get to choose. Right now, the United States government is not choosing who enters this country. The cartels are choosing that. That is dangerous. That is dangerous. And because of the flawed asylum system, they are bringing folks in from countries all around the world. We were at the Yuma port of entry in January, and they told us they had 100 countries represented and over 200 languages represented. Mm -hmm. And one, I got to tell you, I've been going to the Yuma port of entry for 25 plus Never years. And the day that we were there, mm -hmm. we didn't see a single Mexican national in the border facility, mm -hmm. not a single one. And so it's changed. It's different than it used to be, right? When we were, when we were growing up, it was a whole different experience. So we've got to address the flaws in the legal system. The cartels are using a strategy of exploiting the, the asylum system, bringing in people from all over the world, using the asylum system to basically get people into the country, at which point they disappear, never appear before courts, aren't actually qualified for asylum. And because our resources are being pulled to process those applicants and those individuals, the bad guys are coming through, through the hunting fields, and you know these are the guys who are bringing the drugs and who have violent, violent criminal histories in their home countries. So it's a two-pronged process. So what we're seeing in Cochise County is a border security crisis. But in order to solve it, we must also address the cracks in the legal system that need to be addressed so the cartels can't use a multi-pronged strategy to keep us away from doing the border security. Does that make sense? Can, can I just add real yeah. so you're looking You're looking at a group from Texas, California, North Carolina that is focused hardest problems in our country. Why? Because people are dying and our lives are turned upside down. Border security, everybody, I don't care where you fall on the political spectrum, everybody should be against folks that are entering on the terrorist watch list, folks that are bringing over fentanyl that are trying to kill our kids, uh, bad actors, everybody should be against that. And I think we agree with that. And I think everybody should be in support of legal immigration. That's right legal we're a nation of laws we're a nation of immigrants legal immigration once you separate those two it's i think it's pretty clear regardless of where you fall on the spectrum who's gonna these are these are winning issues but it takes a group of members both in the house and the senate to come together and just get it done this can't be the normal this cannot that's be right. normal there is nothing more dangerous if this becomes a new normal for our next generation that's right that's exactly right thank you so much Her last question to the republic and that very quickly um, just really quick, this is a question for everybody. What are y'all's thoughts on Biden's proposed transit ban, and do you think it'll be effective in stemming some of the migrant numbers that we'll be seeing after Title 42 ends? I think it's hard to tell how effective it's going to be because um, while the language of it is promising, it really is a matter of implementation and enforcement. And as we all know, the administration has lots of leeway in whether or not to enforce immigration laws. That has long been established, you know, in, in case law. So. We don't know if the Biden administration is actually going to enforce this or not, so it remains to be seen. That being said, I think all of us would agree that executive action is never an adequate substitute for congressional action. Because if we take action in a bipartisan way, pass a law, get it signed into law, it has the lasting effect and it cannot change with subsequent administrations. So unfortunately, as we were hearing from John, his own life on his ranch, the experience changes between who's president. That's not fair. 
That, that shouldn't be John's experience, right? John should get to expect that the security and safety of his property is consistent from one administration to the next. He doesn't have that promise right now. It's Congress's job to affect laws that create that level of security and predictability for John and his family. I, for one, think it's window dressing on a two and a half year uh, legacy of failed policy. Look, look, nothing changed in Congress. When you go from a half million flows to two million flows to three million flows, the only thing uh, or the primary reason for that increase has to do with the failure of administration to enforce policies that were on the books. This is, we, had, we haven't changed the law. That's right. The administration has changed their posture and they own that. And that is a half measure and not a serious proposal in my mind to fix the problems that That's you right. all are experiencing every day. All right, folks, thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.